Yeah, so as the title suggests, I'll be talking about some work that I've been doing for my PhD, which is looking at the dynamics of glaciers, but through the lens of folding in surge type glaciers. Now, before we get started, I want to draw your attention to this title slide, because you can see here, this is the Dusty Glacier. This is a large surge type glacier that's located just east of the Yukon Alaska border in the St. Elias Mountains. And I particularly want to draw your attention, I hope you can see my cursor, but to this, this beautiful series of folds that's present on the surface of the glacier. And these are highlighted because of sediment that's been deposited onto the ice's surface. Now, each of these folds is the product of the glacier surge. That is to say, an episode of just very brief but very vigorous mass discharge out of this northern tributary into the main trunk of the glacier that sort of deflected the pre existing ice foliation and basically passively folded the ice into the folds you see here. And then you can imagine these are further deformed as they're advected downstream. So today, when I'm going to be talking about sort of glacier scale or valley scale folding, this is really the type of structure that I'll be referring to that we can see here on the dusty glacier surface. So to start now, what I'd like to do is explain to you why we as glaciologists are interested in these types of structures. Why do we care about folding in surge type glaciers? And to do this, I'm going to show you other satellite images of surge type glaciers. I'm going to highlight the folds that are present on their surfaces in red, like I've done here for the Kalani Glacier. I'm going to repeat that for the Dusty Glacier and for other surge type glaciers in the St. Elias Mountains. Now, the key takeaway of this exercise is that there's a lot of different fold geometries that are possible. And these vary based on the different flow regimes of these surge type glaciers. And these flow regimes can be controlled by a variety of parameters, include you know, valley or glacier geometry, ice rheology, basal conditions throughout the surge cycle, and surface mass balance. Surface mass balance is the link between the glacier and the regional climate that effectively controls its mass budget. What's particularly interesting to us as glaciologists is being able to resolve spatial and temporal changes in sliding that occur throughout the surge cycle of these large glaciers. So it's, it's very hard to monitor and instrument uh, the bed of a glacier, especially when there's surges, there's such strain that you often fracture the ice all the way through the ice column. And this will gobble up any instrumentation you leave behind. And so what we're aiming to do here is use the geometry of these folds as a window into that basal environment. Effectively use the shape of these folds as a way to try and reconstruct the histories of basal sliding that these large surge type glaciers experience. And so the title of the talk is really just a statement of what we want to accomplish here. We want to investigate the dynamic drivers of glacier change using the structural glaciology of surge type glaciers. At this point, though, I'd like to slow down a little bit because while this is just one sentence, I think there's a lot of different concepts in here. And what I'd like to do is take the time to really deconstruct this sentence and sort of build up our understanding of glaciers more broadly and then dive into the folding once we've set that stage. So the first thing I want to talk about is the glaciological context. Uh, why do we care about glacier dynamics more broadly? Then we'll take a little bit of a detour. We'll look at how a glacier evolves that is not a surge type glacier. We kind of understand how glaciers behave before we introduce the more complex behavior that is glacier surging. Then we'll talk about glacier surging itself and specifically how it relates to the folds that we want to model. We'll then talk about another study that we did, which was using a fully synthetic environment to delve into the kinematic evolution of these structures in 3D and see how sensitive the geometry is to different elements of the flow regimes of these glaciers. Then I'll end the talk on some ongoing work, which is exporting that method to nature, seeing if we can reconstruct the basal sliding history of the dusty glacier that I showed you at the start of the talk using the method that we developed in our sort of numerical sandbox. So let's start with the glaciological context, and this is really the path we're going to take for the next 40 minutes or so. And for this, I'm going to zoom all the way out. I'm going to show you the Antarctic ice sheet, and this is the largest mass of ice on the planet. And then we have the Greenland ice sheet, which is the second largest mass of ice on the planet. Now, if you were to consider the largest mass of ice on Earth that aren't continental ice sheets, they're actually visible in these two images here. And you can see right away they're minuscule in comparison to the two continental ice sheets. But when we look at the contribution to early 21st century sea level rise from these different reservoirs of ice, 
we find this inversely proportional relationship. Those small glaciers and ice caps are contributing to the majority of sea level rise that we're currently seeing. And this is because these smaller masses of ice respond much more readily to a warming climate and so are dominating sort of the early signal of, of uh, cryospheric change. Now, these are older data, but every time these types of studies are repeated or done under a new angle, we find that the trend is just reinforced and, and if anything, is exacerbated. So what I want to do here is, is break open that contribution of those glaciers and ice caps and show you that an important contribution comes to North America, nearly 50%, which I've highlighted here. And I want to take a second just to highlight the fact that these trends are predicted to continue throughout 21st century. Now, obviously, these numbers change a lot depending on which emissions pathway we end up taking, how much warming occurs, how much more negative mass balance rates become, and so on. But they will continue to be important contributors throughout the foreseeable future. But for today, we're going to zoom in on one region. We're going to look at the Yukon and Alaska slice of this pie. Um, it is not a negligible contributor to sea level rise in its own right, but it happens to also be really interesting from a glacier dynamics perspective. So these are the St. Elias Mountains. It is not just a slice in the pie. You can see a large central ice field that's being drained by these large valley glaciers uh, on both the continental and ocean side. And for context here, we are on the border of Yukon, Alaska in the Elias Mountains. Keep in mind any insights we gain here are transferable to the region as a whole and really to any region where you might have search type glaciers that behave in a similar manner. And just for context, this is, I'm hoping you can see it. I can't see it with people's faces. This is the dusty glacier right here. Um, that uh, I started the talk with. So we're going to zoom into a region that's just north of the Dusty Glacier, and this is what you can see here. You see these large valley glaciers draining this central ice field. Now, the reason we're taking this detour here to talk about these glaciers is that I think it's really important to consider the consequences of glacier change, not just from a sea level rise perspective, although that is a very important consequence, but also from a sort of valley by valley scale, because there's a lot of downstream communities that are directly impacted by glacier, glacier change. Now, a, a notorious example of the consequences of this retreat of these glaciers is the Cascawalsh Glacier, and that's this large glacier that you can see here on the bottom half of the image. Up until 2016, it used to drain its meltwater north into this, this lake here, Kluani Lake, and this is a really important body of water for a lot of people that live in this region, including the Kwani First Nation on whose traditional territory, a lot of our work has taken place. Now, in 2016, because of ongoing retreat of the terminus of this glacier, meltwater was redirected north, ongoing consequences for the Kwani Lake. There was a drop in the water level. This made critical infrastructure like boat launches unusable. Uh, there's ongoing changes to the temperature profile of the lake, and this is impacting fish populations. As you can imagine, this is very concerning for anybody who relies on fishing as part of their livelihood. And we now have this dried up river valley where there's more frequent and severe dust storms. And there's work coming out to really explore the hazard that this might represent for people in the region. And so just zooming back out to the St. Elias Mountains, all of these glaciers are responding to a changing climate. And obviously this is contributing to sea level rise, but also there is a change on a local scale to the downstream hydrology and the downstream, downstream sort of hazards landscape. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. And that's why it's important to study these glaciers individually as well as as a collective. So again, all these glaciers are responding to a changing climate. For the most part, they are retreating, but all of these glaciers are also forced by a range of dynamic regimes or dynamic forcings. That is to say, each of these glaciers has its own personality from a glacier dynamics perspective. An extreme example of that is glacier surging. There's a lot of large surge type glaciers that drain these central ice fields. And so if we want to be able to understand how this region will evolve as a whole and also how each of these different valleys will evolve in terms of glacier change, we need to be able to understand that dynamic side of the problem. And this is what really motivates us to look into glacier dynamics. Now, if we zoom back out, I want to take a second to note that these dynamic processes are generally not geographically isolated. There are a lot of regions in the world that have surge type glaciers, and there are 
outlets to these major continental ice sheets that experience other forms of fast and irregular ice flow, of which Glacier Surgeon is just one end member. Now, we have reason to believe that if we study these processes and understand them better in an area like the St. Elias Mountains, we might be able to better understand them across the board and maybe be better at modeling and forecasting their contribution to how these large ice masses will respond to a change in climate. So just to recap, the natural or the, the St. Elias Mountains are our natural laboratory here. There's the same regional climate acting across the board, but a range of different dynamics that are present. And so glaciologically, our work aims to differentiate those two forcings, climate and dynamics, in looking at glacier change in the St. Elias Mountains. So I think that's, that's the stage for why glacier dynamics are worth looking into from glaciological just talked about disentangling climate and dynamics in a large non-surge type glacier. So it's a little bit of a detour, uh, but there's two reasons I'd like to take it. The first is I recognize not everybody in this room is a glaciologist. And so I'm going to take this opportunity to have a little bit of a tutorial on how glaciers work. The second is that we really want to gain a broader understanding of how out of sync climate and dynamics are in the region before delving into the more complex uh, glacier dynamic behavior that is glacier surging. So you want to start with a simpler case and then work our way towards the more complex cases. Going back to the St. Elias Mountains, the glacier we're going to look at is the Casco Walsh Glacier. You're now familiar with this because of the anecdote that I shared with you earlier. The reason we want to look at this glacier again is twofold. The first is that it's actively losing mass. This is a map of surface elevation change between 2007 and 2018. This is going to be sort of our modern climate window because we have really good data for this time, so I'll come back to that a lot. Here red is surface lowering or mass loss and blue is mass gain. And so there's a lot more red than there is blue, especially for the Casquelch Glacier. Now the second reason we want to look at this glacier specifically is it's one of the few large glaciers in this region that isn't a surge type glacier. So we have reason to believe that it might very well be a very good indicator for how the St. Elias Mountains as a whole are doing in terms of the imbalance between climate and dynamics, because it cuts through the noise of glacier surging, which again is a more complicated glacier dynamic behavior. If we zoom in on the Gaskolsch Glacier, this is a sort of cleaned up elevation change map. You can see that we've calculated an average thinning rate of nearly half a meter per year. So it's actively losing mass at, at a very alarming rate. Now, if you were standing in these sort of northern valleys here and looking down at the Gaskolsch Glacier, you'd see something that looks like this. Here, the north arm and central arm merge into the main trunk of the glacier. And for scale here, the ice is nearly six kilometers in width and nearly a kilometer in thick. So there's a lot of ice trapped in just this one valley. Now, as glaciologists, um, we can determine how a glacier will evolve through time using a continuity equation, such as the one shown here. Today, you, you don't need to understand this equation fully. Really, what it's telling us is that any change in glacier shape through time depends on a combination of both ice flow and mass balance. And what those terms are telling us is really gravity and climate together are what shape the glacier through time. And I'd like to talk about both those things in a little more detail, starting with climate. So net mass balance is really how we look at the climate-driven mass budget that a glacier has. And conceptually, it's quite simple. It's the difference between accumulation, which is primarily derived from snowfall, and ablation, which is primarily derived from melting. Now here up high, I've got these blue arrows. And here you can see that the snowpack is still visible. And this picture was taken late in August. And this is because up high, temperatures are lower, there's less melting, and you actually don't melt through the seasonal snowpack. You bury it, it transforms into ice, and it replenishes the mass of the glacier. Down low, where I have these red arrows, you can see the ice. And this is telling us that here we melted through the seasonal snowpack. We're actually melting the ice itself. We're depleting the mass of the glacier. And so what allows the glacier to exist in spite of this you know, elevation-driven imbalance is glacier dynamics. It is the gravity-driven flow of ice that redistributes mass away from where it's being replenished to where it's being depleted. And this is through a combination of frictionally controlled sliding at the bed of the glacier and polycrystalline ice creep within the body of the ice itself. So together, dynamics and climate shape the glacier through time. That's really how glaciers evolve. So for this study that I'm going to walk through very quickly, we're trying 
attempt to characterize the mass loss of the Casco Walsh Glacier by determining the imbalance between those two forces, climate and dynamics, or specifically its ice fluxes and its surface mass balance for that time period that we're interested in. And recall that the true goal here is to gain regional insight. We want to understand how the, the whole population of glaciers in the St. Elias Mountains might be doing before really delving into the more complicated valleys that exist. So to do this, we decided we would use the continuity equation. The thinking was if we could independently determine each term in the equation, we could directly compare them and assess the imbalance between climate and dynamics. The first term is the elevation change term. You've seen this data already. This is the elevation change map that I showed you, and it's really the motivating piece of data for this study. The second term are the actual fluxes of the glacier. How was it actually flowing between 2007 and 2018? And the third term is the mass balance. And here we convert this to balance fluxes, which are really just the fluxes that the glacier should have if it were totally adjusted with the climate of 2007 to 2018. And so what I'd like to do here is quickly present to you the pieces of data that we use for those two blue and red terms, and then we'll compare them directly. Let's start with the actual ice fluxes. So calculating discharge through a flux gate is quite straightforward. You really just need the cross-sectional area and the velocity of the mass traveling through that. And then the product of those two things will give you discharge. We use this to have an experimental design on the Cass Walsh Glacier, where we basically set up nine flux gates, five in the main trunk of the glacier, and four where the main tributaries enter that main trunk. Because we wanted to assess the imbalance, not just glacier-wide, but across the sort of elevation gradient of the main trunk of the glacier. Now, for cross-sectional area, well, we walked across the glacier with an ice-penetrating radar apparatus and measured the depth of the ice bedrock reflection. This is what it looked like when you're walking across the ice. We did this several times and gathered those measurements as we were bringing the instrument across. And ultimately, this allowed us to derive maps of cross-sectional area for each of our nine flux gates with the associated uncertainty, which are shown here. We also need the depth average velocity. Thankfully, there's good surface velocity maps that are derived from Landsat image pairs. We can make some assumptions on how that varies with depth and ultimately have profiles of depth average velocity for each of our nine flux gates. Now, the product of those two things gives us discharge. And we were able to cal calculate the discharge for each of our nine flux gates, tracking the uncertainty throughout. So we know how the glacier was flowing between 2007 and 2018. We also want to know how it should have been flowing if it were in balance with the climate forces. For this, we model the surface mass balance. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail today. I don't think uh, this is you know, the, the audience for it, but I just want to note that while it is conceptually simple to calculate net mass balance, the difference between accumulation and inflation, there's a whole subfield of ways to model surface mass balance. Everything from more sort of empirically based temperature index models to fully physically based energy balance models. So we decided to go in the middle. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of the modeling, but just to show you some of what goes into the process. You need to acquire climate data. What you can acquire, you need to model. You need to do some pre-processing. You then need to downscale this to the correct resolution using multiple statistical methods. You need to do a lot of model tuning. You have to run your model several times and make sure that it's performing well by comparing your model outputs to empirical measurements from field work or from uh, satellite data. You then have to aggregate the results of model runs that best perform compared to your empirical data. And throughout, you have to quantify uncertainty because you want to make sure that what you are modeling is representative of reality within an acceptable range. Otherwise, it's useless to you. But ultimately, what all this gives us is a map of surface mass balance for the glacier. And here you can see that here. And you can see that beautiful striping where we've taken into account the effects of debris that's insulating the surface of the ice. It's lowering the amount of melting that occurs. Here we were able to calculate the idea being that if the glacier were totally in sync with the regional climate, any mass deposited upstream has to flow through a downstream flux gate. You'll note those two negative values. Uh, this is telling us that if the glacier were totally adjusted to, to the climate of 2007 to 2018, the ice would have to be flowing uphill through these flux gates, which obviously is impossible. But what it's telling us really is that the position of the terminus would have to be located quite a ways upstream. And we'll come back to that in a second. All right, we know the actual fluxes of the glacier. We know how it was flowing between 2007 and 2018. 
And we know the surface mass balance. We know how it should have been flowing had it been totally adjusted. I'd like to compare those two things directly. We're going to have fluxes on the y axis here, and each of our nine flux gates going from up glacier on the left to down glacier on the right on the x axis. First, we'll look at the actual fluxes, and the shading is always going to be the uncertainty in yellow. Then we'll look at the balance fluxes in red. And the third quantity I want to show you are the same balance fluxes, but here we've scaled the net mass balance to zero. We've basically scaled the climate to the current shape of the glacier. So just to clarify, this blue curve is showing you how the glacier should be flowing if it were, based on its current shape, totally adjusted to an arbitrary climate. The yellow curve is showing us how it is flowing, and the red curve is showing us how it should be flowing were it totally adjusted to the 2007 and 2018 uh, climate. You can see right away that the yellow curve is closer in magnitude and sh shape to the blue curve. And this is telling us that the glacier is in the earliest stages of dynamic readjustment. Uh, it is flowing unsustainably. And those two sort of negative values really are giving us information on where the of the Squash Glacier should be located if it were totally adjusted. This is just an estimate uh, of 20, and it is very much a conservative estimate because we don't take into account further climate warming uh, and some of the couplings of dynamics and, and climate that can exacerbate the effect of the glaciation. But I want to zoom back out because the goal of this was really to gain regional insight. So we know that this is how much of the Cascawash Glacier should be deglaciated just based on the 2007 to 2018 climate. And recall, while these are older data, there will be further warming in the 21st century regardless of which emissions pathway we end up going down, mass balance rates will become more and more negative. So this, again, very much a conservative estimate. And so I'd recommend for everyone a sort of mental exercise, which is to try and map that red area over all the other masses of ice that you see here, because that is really what this glacier is telling us. It is telling us that this is, broadly speaking, the forecast for the St. Elias Mountains as a whole. So just to recap, uh, again, I don't want to focus on the details here, but we've gained that regional insight. And we have sort of a dire forecast for the St. Elias Mountains based on that. And uh, oh, and this, I wanted to cut this slide, but this is, is really just to indicate that we are currently working on coupling our surface mass balance model with uh, a glacier dynamics model to really forecast when that will happen and take into account the further effects of climate change. But for today, I think we now have a good understanding of how glaciers work and, and sort of uh, how the St. Elias Mountains as a whole are poised in terms of the balance between dynamics and climate. So now I'd like to dive into glacier surging and talk about the folds that are derived from glacier surges. And just recall, there are many large surge type glaciers that are draining the central ice fields in the St. Elias Mountains, right? So this is where we can't repeat the same exercise we did for the Cassis Walsh Glacier, we need to be able to reconstruct the flow histories of these glaciers if we are to stand any chance of understanding how they will evolve in the future. So what is glacier surging? It's a type of unstable dynamic behavior. Uh, it specifically refers to glaciers that experience dramatic and, and episodic increases in flow velocity. We're talking several orders of magnitude, and these can last anywhere from months to several years. Now there's two phases to a glacier surge. There's a quiescent flow phase. During this phase, there's very limited friction, or sorry, very limited sliding at the bed. So there's not a lot of mass communication from upstream to downstream. And you start to pile up mass up high, you create a reservoir of ice. Then there will be a usually hydraulically controlled switch to very low effective pressures at the bed that lead to very high sliding velocities. And this is the, slur the surging flow phase. And this is when you have rapid mass discharge of that reservoir down into the lower parts of the glacier. And that is the glacier surge. Now, to kind of capture how this process acts, I'd like you to consider this glacier that you can see here, where I've highlighted the terminus and a tributary in red. And consider what happens if we go forward just one year into the future when a surge is happening. I'll do that a few times for you. You can see that there's significant advance of the terminus and quite a change in shape in the configuration of the moraine in the confluence region. And that is that passive deformation of pre-existing ice foliation that ultimately creates the folds that we want to look at. Now, if you were standing where this red star is located, 
and looking down into the reservoir region, you'd see something that looks like this. You can see the ice is totally fractured, and that's just the effect of the strain of all this displacement downstream. If you were to look closely, though, you might see where the reservoir used to be present as it's been sheared off margins. And I don't have a scale here, but these cliffs are dozens of meters high, which really gives you the amount of mass that's required to fuel this advance and ultimately create the structures that we're interested in studying. So going back, I showed you at the very beginning of the talk is derived from the same process that we just explored. Now I want to take a second to show you this animation. Uh, it's from the Karakor region uh, of the Himalayas, so not at all the same part of the world. It's a Landsat imagery mosaic. But if we look at these two places and zoom in, you can really see this process in action. You can see how those pulses of mass being discharged downstream indent the lower valleys. And then those indentations are further deformed as they are advected downstream. Now, obviously, this is a really complicated dendritic valley network, and, and it would be a nightmare to model. But I think it's a great way to build a mental picture of how these folds form. I do want to take a second just to note that studying these types of structures isn't something new, though. This is this is the Malaspina Glacier, it's an iconic glacier that drains into the Gulf of Alaska. And you can see this, this beautiful series of folds right here. Now, in 1963, Hans Ramberg, who's done a lot of work on viscous deformation of rocks, used this as a, as a target for some analog model, looking at how a mass constriction might impact downstream structures based on viscosity contrasts. Um, using these structures as a diagnostic method of identifying uh, or a diagnostic feature for surge type glaciers has been happening for decades. This is just an example here of, of Austin Post's sort of very pioneering work where he flew around in the single ice mountains and identified a lot of surge type glaciers for the first time by using the presence of these folds on the surface as an indicator. Now, it's only recent that people have started to really explicitly model these types of structures. Uh, this, this is just grabbed from a pair of, of wonderful companion papers by Clark and Hambry and Hambry and Clark, where they tried to recreate the full structural assemblage that they saw in the field uh, on Trackridge Glacier, a small search type glacier in the St. Elias Mountains. And a part of what they looked at was the surface trace of the moraine, as you can see here. And, and this is really where we take off, because the next thing I want to walk through is our synthetic modeling study, where we looked in a sort of fully controlled numerical sandbox at these types of structures and tried to assess their kinematics and understand how sensitive they may be to different elements of the flow regimes of surge type glaciers. So the goal here is going to be to explore the sensitivity of full geometry, different elements of surge type glaciers, flow regimes in a controlled environment. Recall at the, at the start of the talk, I, I showed you all these different satellite images and folds and I said, oh, look at all these different folds. There's all these possible controlling factors. And what we're going to do now is we're going to change some of these factors and see how that impacts fold geometry. I want to take a second just to note that this is the first 3D uh, numerical modeling characterization of these types of folds. So we're really laying the groundwork. We're building our conceptual understanding of these structures before exporting that method into nature. So I don't want to spend too much time on the numerical modeling setup, but I think it's important to at least touch on it to give everybody sort of uh, the information they need to, to be able to really critically evaluate these results. We use Elmore Ice, which is a full Stokes numerical modeling package. Um, we set up these fairly simple confluence configurations like the one you can see here, effectively two tributaries that merge into the main trunk of a glacier. We then spun up steady state glaciers across a range of glacier or valley geometries. Uh, dynamic behaviors and climate, or as you now know, uh, mass balance forcings. So effectively, we built um, an inventory of glaciers across a range of flow regimes in order to then make them surge and see how the folds that resulted differed. Now, a second just to talk about surging, because it's not actually straightforward to have surging in a model such as this. Models don't like it when you just crank up the velocity and bring it back down arbitrarily. So what we did is we set a reservoir region, this northern tributary, as is highlighted here, and we prescribed periods of very low resistance to sliding. Effectively, this resulted in uh, these pulses of high velocity that resembled what we see in nature, both in magnitude and distribution. So we emulate the surge process in our model environment. We then seed particles into our model glaciers. And these particles are meant to really crudely 
uh, recreate where you would expect to have ice foliation present in these types of glaciers. And you can see when that pulse of mass travels into the main trunk of the glacier, it deflects it, effectively creating the folds that we're interested in studying. And you can see on the left that we're doing this throughout the entire ice column. We're not just looking at these folds on the surface because we want to look at the full 3D kinematic evolution of these structures. Now, the last thing we did is we considered that any combination of three particles is in fact a plane and therefore has an associated strike and dip. And we can extract the pole to that plane. And here you're looking at how the aggregate of planes that describe that entire fold train layer, effectively the, the multiple events of surging and folding, evolves through time in the serenet on the left. And this allowed us to extract information on different structural metrics that we use to differentiate the geometries of our folds between simulations. So what I'd like to do here is walk you through a, an archetype for the kinematic evolution of these types of folds that we created using our model. And we're going to look at some block diagrams like the one here on the right. Uh, a few things to note. We're going to be looking at the well, epsilon dot xx component of the surface strain rate tensor. So the sort of longitudinal uh, strain rate in the x direction. Uh, this obviously doesn't tell the full story, but it's a good way, I think, to intuitively understand some of the changes that we see in our structures as they happen. I also want to draw your attention to this, uh, this velocity pattern that I've sketched here, because it's really how a glacier behaves during quiescence. You have some sliding that's communicated all the way up the ice column, and then the bulk of the velocity during quiescent flow is determined from uh, deformation. You have minimums at the edges where the sort of adjacent and underlying bedrock of the valley uh, bottom and walls drag against the ice. Now we're going to look at our folds at multiple phases of deformation. This is, this is really a continuum of deformation, but we've sort of inserted these phases at points that make sense to break up the surge cycle. First, let's look at D1. This is immediately following the termination of the surge that emplaces the structure. You can see we have strong extensional flow up high as that reservoir travels downstream. It's leaving extensional flow in its wake. And then there's compression down low as the pulse of mass enters the main trunk of the glacier and encounters resistance. For the most part, our folds are forming in between these two flow regimes and the confluence regions of glaciers. Now, at this stage, the fold is pretty straightforward. Uh, it has a vertically plunging fold axis. The axial surface is normal to the flow direction and vertically uh, dipping, although there's, there's a slight decrease in the dip nearest to the bed of the glacier. You can see that in that bottom stereo, and this is telling us that there is some influence of basal drag throughout the surge cycle. And the interim angle varies based on the simulation, but it's open to gentle as it's quite a large interim. Let's look at what happens after a period of quiescent overprint in D2. This is following the recharge of the reservoir and just before the next surge is triggered. We now have essential flow throughout that pulse of mass has been communicated quite a ways down into the terminus region of the glacier. Here, you can't really tell. There's some rotation of the axial surface uh, laterally, but really you can see the decrease in dip that is present not just at the bed, but quite a ways up the ice column. This is showing us the prolonged influence of basal drag that's modifying this fold. You can't really see it here unless you're really keen eyed, but the interlim angle has actually increased. And we find that at this stage, the fold limbs, because of the extensional flow, are actually being rotated outward. So the fold is being unfolded to a certain extent in this first intersurge interval. Now we're going to fast forward to D6. This is after the fold has been ejected downstream through multiple surge cycles. Um, you can see right away that it's a much more complex structure. Now the axial surface is oblique to the fold, uh, the, the flow direction. And this is because of uh, lateral drag that's slowly rotating the axial surface into parallelism with the flow direction. It's also dipping horizontally near the bed and really only approaches vertical nearest the surface because of prolonged, in this case, multiple surges is several centuries worth of basal drag acting on these structures. And the interlim angle is much smaller. There's tightening because of that lateral rotation of the axial surface moving the limbs against each other, but also because in the terminus regions of glaciers, you have more and more melting. So you have this negative mass gradient that creates a negative velocity gradient, and therefore compressive flow, and that further tightens the fold. So this, this is our archetype for the kinematic evolution of these types of structures. But what we want to look at is how differences in flow regime impact the fold geometry. An example of this is looking at what happens when you change the valley geometry of the glacier. Here we're looking at differences in bed slope, differences in 
um, confluence angle and differences in the size of the surging tributary. And you can see right away, especially looking at the bottom right, there are differences in the surface trace of the fold. Now, what we found when we look at our results across all our simulations, and this includes differences in dynamic forcings and in climatic forcings or mass balance forcings, is that the same archetype for kinematic evolution applies throughout all of these folds evolve the same way. However, the magnitude of change in the attitude of the axial surface in the interlimb angle varies based on the different flow regime. And we have reason to believe that we might be able to use that magnitude of change as a way to fingerprint flow regimes in folds in nature. And so this was kind of the last question that we asked ourselves in this study was, could we recreate, at least qualitatively, and these are some of the glaciers I showed you earlier on. And the answer is yes. If we select more complex parameter combinations, we can qualitatively recreate structures that are very similar to what we find in nature. And this is kind of the sort of entrance to the last part of the talk. We've used the previous study to really lay the conceptual groundwork to understand how these folds evolve and how sensitive their geometries are to different aspects of the flow regimes of these glaciers, but also have a proof of concept that we can use this in more complex natural environments. And so what I'd like to do for the rest of the talk is show you some ongoing work on exporting that method to nature for the dusty glaciers. So again, this is ongoing work. You won't have all the answers on this one, but we'll look at a few things that I think are quite interesting. So again, we're back to the dusty glacier. So where we started the talk is where we will end the talk. Uh, and really what we're trying to do here is determine the dynamic history of the dusty glacier or histories, because it might be a non-unique answer using the geometry of the surface fold train as a guide. And I'm, I'm bringing back the continuity equation here because I think it's an excellent way to sort of inventory all the pieces of data and all the pieces of information that we need to successfully reconstruct the flow history of this glacier. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is determine this term in the equation. We want to determine the possible dynamic forcings that led us to the shape of fold that we have here. So we need to define geometrical targets. We need to be sure that we are modeling the dusty glacier in order to have results that are appropriate to the dusty glacier. We also need to define the mass balance forcing. We need the right mass budget for this glacier, again, for it to be representative of what we see in nature. So I'll walk through very quickly about how we set up these different things. Mass balance forcing is easy. Uh, well, I say easy. I mean, we, we spent three years building a quite sophisticated mass balance model, but we were then able to use that to create a, a very detailed surface mass balance forcing for the dusty glacier. The geometrical targets are actually quite varied. There's a few things we have to consider. We need the right glacier bed. We need to be modeling the shape of the dusty glacier for our results to be applicable to the dusty glacier. It sounds obvious, but it's something to take into account. The other sort of uh, geometrical targets are the fold itself, and we'll talk about that in more detail, in you know, everything from its interval, its kinematics, to potentially some 3D information as well. For the glacier bed, what we did is we went into the field, and here you can see our field camp, and that is the moraine that I've been showing you throughout the talk. You can see where the debris has insulated the ice and effectively created this, this towering mound uh, of, of material. We used our ice penetrating radar apparatus to go out and measure the thickness of the glacier at multiple points. There are existing model derived beds for glaciers such as the Dusty Glacier, but we wanted to have you know, on the ground measurements to really uh, constrain those model beds and have the, the best possible estimate. And ultimately this allowed us to create a version of the Dusty Glacier, uh, which an example is shown here. Now the key geometrical target is the full train itself. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a few pieces of information that we need here. We need the surge interval. We need to know how long there usually is between surges. Now, on this, we got really lucky. There was this fantastic study in 1965 where uh, people went and visited the Dusty Glacier and found it completely obliterated in the midst of a massive surge. And they had some, uh, hard to assess the, the fidelity of it, but some dendrochronologic evidence that suggested that the previous surge before that was in 1925, so approximately a 40-year interval. Now, what's especially interesting here is that this would suggest a surge in the early 2000s. And what we found is that with our model, we weren't able to reproduce today's structure without allowing for a surge to occur in the early 2000s. And so by going back through Landsat imagery, we actually found a previously undocumented surge. And I'd like to walk you through that. This is the Dusty Glacier in 2001. Uh, 
immediately following or sorry preceding a surge, although it probably has already started. Then in 2002, you can see that there's quite a bit of fracturing in the northern part of the glacier. This is the surge that's well underway, and we're starting to deflect the medial moraine here. And then in 2003, the surge is winding down. You can see a full indentation of that medial moraine, which is really the next fold in this series being emplaced. And then if we move forward into the future, you can see how quiescent flow has continued to exact that flow downwards with this much higher quality imagery. So ultimately, what we have here is pretty exciting. We have a full record of the kinematics of the surge for the Dusty Glacier, as well as a constraint on what 16 years of quiescent flow would look like in the structure afterwards. Now, we'll come back to that in a second. The last thing I want to talk about is getting some 3D information. Now, uh, I'm not going to go too into detail in this because I, I haven't sat down with the data and, and given it the sort of time it deserves. But this is motivated by the fact that when you're in the field or even just looking at these images here, there's quite a bit of structural complexity that you might not see if you just look at the main medial moraine trace. And so in the field, we attempted to map foliation across the glacier using exposures either through fracturing or hydrological features, uh, looking for foliation planes that were exposed at multiple points in the glacier. And I've got some examples here. The idea being that we want to determine whether or not we can differentiate the attitude of the structures downstream from those upstream, because this should include the signal of ongoing deformation during abduction. But also, you can imagine that as you are melting the ice, you are in fact excavating the fold lower down in terms of where it was when the actual surge happened. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to stop here on these data because I, again, we haven't gone too far on these, but I think they're pretty cool. All right, to close off the talk, we now know the geometrical targets that we need. We've defined the mass balance force and we want to determine the possible dynamic forcings. We want to try and reconstruct the flow history of the Dusty Glacier. Now, I want to take a second that this is very much ongoing work. The models are running as we speak. My computer is actually running simulations now. So, you know, these models will, or the results will only improve with time. But what I'd like to do is walk you through an initial attempt to try to reproduce the kinematics of the surge in 2001 to 2003. Note that we don't just set the model at an initial condition in 2001 and run it. We actually spin it up over multiple surge cycles, so a century and a half of, of flow before approaching even the start of the surge. And what we find is that in 2001, we're able to quite closely reproduce the shape of the medial moraine. Here, the white dots are the model output, and those silver spheres that are a little fatter, those are picked from the Landsat imagery. Now, following the surge in 2003, we continue to match that structure quite well, although there's a little bit of a gap here, indicating that perhaps our surge was not vigorous enough. And finally, after the quiescent flow phase, we continue to be able to track that structure, but you can still see that gap that comes from uh, our initial surge. This is really exciting because what it allows us to say is that there must have been a 150 times increase in peak velocity to create the structure that we see here. And from this, we can glean some very valuable information on the frictional uh, environment of the bed throughout the surge cycle. So really what we're interested in going forward is being able to assess these surges in the future and in the past. Will they continue to happen? And in the past, were they as vigorous, more vigorous, less vigorous? And so we're really thinking about these structures, which, you know, full geometry, if you simplify it in this case, the surface trace of these folds is really just a combination of amplitude and wavelength. In terms of sliding magnitude, both in terms of how much sliding had to occur during the surge and how much sliding occurs during quiescence in between surges, but also in terms of mass balance, how much reservoir growth do you need to fuel this advance and how much of a past anomaly, knowing that mass balance hasn't always been what it is today, do you need to faithfully recreate the structures that you see today. And so what we're doing now is we're running multiple simulations across this sort of mass balance sliding space to find out where the optimum answer for reconstructing the flow history of the dusty glacier may lie. And here are just some examples of two different simulations shown on the right. All right, I'm going to stop here. I just want to recap uh, by saying that the first thing we did was try to gain a regional understanding. We looked at the imbalance between climate and dynamics for the Cass Walsh Glacier and really to assess the St. Elias Mountains as a whole. We then delved into the surge type glaciers that have a more complex dynamic behavior. The first thing we did was build our conceptual understanding of the structures in a fully controlled numerical environment, understand how they evolved. 
and how sensitive they are to different elements of the flow regime. And now we are exporting that method to nature. We are applying it to the Dusty Glacier. And going forward, this has sort of opened up a ton of different possible applications, some of which we're working on, some of which we'd like to work on. Everything from better coupling of the mass balance and dynamics models to really take into account the effects of climate change, to looking at how this would proceed in different surge type glaciers. If you can do it for one, you can do it for many and look at the population as a whole, to looking at some of the more uh, complicated rheological realities that might be present that could exacerbate or limit ice flux and play a role as well as mass balance and sliding. So that's where I'm going to stop for today. Uh, and, and thanks for, for taking the time to, to listen to me talk about glaciers.